In the winter of 1776, at Valley Forge, Tom Paine wrote, These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of his country. But he who stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. I have today ordered to Vietnam the Air Mobile Division and certain other forces which will raise our fighting strength from 75,000 to 125,000 men almost immediately. Additional forces will be needed later, and they will be sent as requested. I got to Vietnam in March of 66 as a new guy in my unit called Alpha 111, known as Alpha North. Um, I was put on guard duty because I was a new guy. And my third week on guard duty, I was standing guard with an unloaded rifle guarding an artillery base when we were attacked by Viet Cong sappers and overrun. Our grenades were taped up so if the pins came out by accident, the spoons wouldn't fly and no one would get hurt and our rifles weren't allowed to be loaded, and the rules were we couldn't load without permission and we couldn't fire without permission. And if you saw something, you'd call the sergeant and the guard in the guard shack. Well, the sergeant and the guard walked around and checked to make sure people weren't sleeping. And when he was going around, the gooks got him. So then when the people saw the gooks inside the fence, they asked for permission and there was no one there and they didn't fire. So they, they just wiped us out. And uh, my post was the only post they didn't take. They took the other three posts. And as soon as I saw them, like, I wasn't going to ask anybody. We just started shooting. And so the first time that you kill people and that you see your friends killed is is very heavy experience. And this one I'm telling you about right now, I didn't used to be able to talk about, but we've dealt with this in my therapy. So I'm glad that I'm talking about it and I'm at, able to actually smile and not be just I'm thrown by that. And the next morning, I looked at a, I went and I looked at my five friends that were dead. And uh, I pulled the sheets off of them, and I looked at them real close. And then I said, you know, like, you know, this is really real. Someone wants to really kill me. And, uh, you know, if I make one mistake, I don't get another chance. So I can't make any mistakes. And that's what I said. And I decided at that point that I would kill anyone I could, you know, knowing whether they were innocent or not, just to make sure I wouldn't get killed. And that was my philosophy. Like, if I'd go into a village and have to kill 100, 100 people just to make sure there was no one there to shoot me when I walked out, that's what I did, and uh, that's what I did when I was there. Marine. 
I wanted to have that self-esteem. It was really important to me. I was going to be somebody. I was going to be a man. I was going to be a Marine. I was going to be a hero. I was going to have medals. I was going to be a good American. And the first day in boot camp when I woke up, um, I thought I was in a bad dream. And I was trying to wake up. And I couldn't wake up. And it was real what was happening. And I thought to myself, I got to get out of here. Um, but there was no way to get out. They knocked, they broke two of my teeth because I uh, didn't conform as quickly as I was supposed to. We were supposed to run three miles before each meal and three miles after each meal with full packs. And uh, I just couldn't see throwing up my meal, you know. So the day we were running, I just, I didn't run, I just started walking. And if the man in front of you falls down, you have to run him over. If you go around him, you get beat up. Because if he knows you're going to run him over, he won't fall down. So I just stepped out to the side and let him all run past me and started walking. And they said, run, you know. He says, what's your, he said, what's your name? I said, Private Camille, sir. He says, you better start running. I says, I'm tired. <laughs> and he says, get up in the barn, you're going to be sorry. I said, I'm already sorry. <laughs> So I went up there and they called where we lived, the barn. And they were going to send me to Motivation Platoon. That's where they, uh, that's makes boot camp seem like Sunday school. So then they said, okay, we'll, we'll handle it in the closet, closet motivation. So I went in the closet and the two of them came in. They said, about face, and I turned around and two fists hit me. And I didn't even fight back. I said, okay, you know, I give up, I'll run. <laughs> you know, you had to be able to, to fight and not cry. And, and I didn't question where those things came from. I just accepted everything. Because I just didn't think for myself. I just accepted this is how the rules are, this is how things are. Um, but um, when I used to get beat all the time by my stepfather and I would cry, and he'd tell me I would never be a man. You know, I wanted to be a man. I wanted to be able to be beat and not cry. My stepfather's job was to make tapes for something called Let Freedom Ring. And you would dial Freedom, F-R-E-E-D-O-M, on the, on the telephone and um, get a recorded message about the communist conspiracy. Now, I didn't really know what communists were because um, as children, Adults think that you don't have the ability to understand a lot, so they just um, simplify things for you. And Bert the turtle was very alert. When danger threatened him, he never got hurt. He knew just what to do. He ducked and cover. Duck and cover. Duck. You have to duck and cover yourself. So you got to duck and get under the desk. Um, if there's nothing to get under, you cover yourself. You don't look at the flash. We must be ready every day, all the time, to do the right thing if the atomic bomb explodes. Duck and cover. This family knows what to do. But if you would have said to me during those days, what is a communist? All I would have been able to say is they're Russians and um, they want to enslave the world. We intend to convince the communists that we cannot be defeated by force of arms or by superior power. They're not easily convinced. Then I, I thought about the political thing again. I said, well, you know, and I wrote my mother a letter. And I told her, I said, I'm not coming home in April because uh, I really believe what we're doing is right. And I think it's better for me to stay here and help get it cleaned up if I can than for my brother to have to come over when he gets old enough. And that's what I wrote and that's what was put in the newspaper. And they had a big article, you know, we need more Americans like this. You're in combat. And a couple of weeks later, you're just walking the street, and 
and nobody knows what's going on in this other place and nobody knows what's in your brain nobody knows about all the suffering over there and everybody's just having their lives like nothing's going on you know and um, uh, what's going on over there is serious but nobody back here everybody just had their lives the war didn't affect people and now I would like to address a word if I may to the young people of this nation who are particularly concerned and I understand why they are concerned about this war. I respect your idealism. I share your concern for peace. I want peace as much as you do. You know, you see these bums, you know, blowing up the campuses. Listen, the boys that are on the college campuses today are the luckiest people in the world going to the greatest universities. And here they are, burning up the books. I mean, storming around about this issue. I mean, you name it, get rid of the war, there'll be another one. Many individuals are caught up by emotional contagion. Their own curiosity, a desire to see what's going on, will draw them to a gathering. And then the sheer emotional weight of the group will stimulate them to active participation. For this reason, People must be kept out of the disturbed area. I became the riot control NCO for 10th Marines. And um, during that time, there were demonstrations in Washington. And the military was on standby all the time for these demonstrations. So we had to prepare the people what they're supposed to do if they go to a demonstration. So um, basically what they taught us and what I was supposed to teach people is that um, what our job is, is to protect lives and to protect property. We will use the minimum amount of force necessary to achieve those goals. I said, um, we're going to stand by to go to Washington this weekend. One person throws a rock, a bottle, or anything at us. I want every man to empty one full magazine into the crowd. And that's going to knock this shit off. They won't fuck with our weekends anymore. We won't be on standby. We'll be able to go home, and we won't have these fucking demonstrations. It'll be the end of that crap. And um, um, my commanding officer found out about it, and I was relieved from that job. And they were horrified. And I didn't think I did anything wrong, because at that time, I considered the anti-war people to be the same as the Viet Cong. I got wounded twice. My friends are dying. And um, supposedly, it's to make life over here good. And you're supporting the other side? bullshit with that I ain't for that so I was really hostile towards the anti-war people and I felt that um, if we just killed a bunch of them that would take care of it and the Marine Corps took me off of that job one of the lessons that I learned in Vietnam was that um, you could be alive one second and dead the next second and you don't know when that next second is coming so you better enjoy today because you might not be here tomorrow and when I came home I wanted to have fun I wanted to live, um, uh, which for the most part, for me, meant um, sex and drugs. She claimed that the American government was lying about the U.S. conduct of its war in Vietnam, and that it was the duty of patriotic Americans who had been to Vietnam to come forward and let people know what U.S. policy in Vietnam really was. I wish that all of you could have been, as I was, at, a, at, a, at an investigation sponsored by a national organization called the Vietnam Veterans Against the War. It, there were 130 officers and enlisted men who came to Detroit two months ago to testify to war crimes that they have committed, to testify to the fact that My Lai massacres, maybe on a lesser scale, are happening daily in Southeast Asia. Yes, people have a right to know in the democracy, but also I can brag a little bit about what I did. I'm a veteran. I'm proud. I'm a fucking Marine sergeant. I got medals. I'm proud. I want them to know. And they couldn't believe it. Not only um, did I have, um, I was articulate and I had documentation and I had a good military record. Um, and they asked me if I would be willing to go to Detroit to testify. And I said yes. Um, they paid for it. I went up there. I didn't know what I was getting into. Give your name, what unit you were in in the NAM, when you were in the NAM. You know, just tell a little bit of what you saw to make it more clear, you know, exactly what happened. Sergeant Camille, 
I know you. You're an FO. Right. You were there. You were in uh, Alpha Battery 111. Right. I, I know this guy, man. <laughs> oh, I'll be well, right up. So all the experiences all of a sudden just start rushing back at this point? Right, and I decided that all the things I did really wasn't right, and that I should think of people as human beings, not as black or white or, uh, uh, or red, or even what, the, what their uh, philosophies were. Initially, he would speak on behalf of the Vietnam War, and he supported the war. And, uh, and then, slowly, you know, in, oh, he, he went through a transition uh, while engaged in these discussions of Vietnam, and he'd say, yeah, I support Vietnam, I support what we're doing over there, and then some other people, the, the anti-war people who would talk to him or argue with him would bring up these points, and Scott would, would, had an attitude like, well, I'll show them wrong, and he'd look up what they were saying, and he started reading about it, and he started, oh, and he'd say, oh, wow, they're right, you know, or I never knew this. I had to admit that I was a murderer, that I murdered people who were defending their homes. I was wounded for nothing. The blood that I left on the ground in Vietnam was wasted. My buddies that died, died for nothing. All they bought with their lives was a black marble wall in Washington. They were lied to and used by their government. And all of the sacrifices that we made were waste. It was a waste. And, and the the cream of my generation were wasted in the rice paddies of Southeast Asia. That was really very hard for me to admit. Once I admitted that, then I was very angry at the people that caused it to happen, which was the government. He was the kind of person who could do this, meaning that he could take a leadership role. He, he was like a lightning rod. And every, you know, people, he, he was the spokesperson, so he, he attracted all the hate and, and an, the animosity that was, that was directed to him. You know, peop, he, he'd walk down the street and people he'd never seen before would spit at him and yell at him and, you know, this kind of stuff. It was, and then other people would see him and say, oh, hey, uh, congratulations, here's some money or something. Here, keep up the good work. I mean, that, that was the kind of uh, duality that he uh, lived with. And we wanted to do something that was significant, that was graphic, and that was historical. Never before had veterans of any nation marched on their capital during a war, denounced the war, and thrown their medals away. I remember going to the different congressional offices and you know lobbying our Congress peoples. The Supreme Court said late yesterday the veterans could not sleep at their campsite, but they did anyway. And when they went to bed, they really expected to be arrested, or as they call it, busted. But nothing happened. I, I remember seeing the papers the next day. It was pretty cool. It said uh, it, it was Vietnam vets overruled Supreme Court. Nixon was trying to get rid of us because we were viable. We were believable because all of us had, had experience in Vietnam. Lieutenant Pomerol died, so I got a medal. Sergeant John died, so I got a medal. I got a Silver Star, Purple Heart, Army Commendation Medal, eight Air Medals, National Defense, and the rest of this garbage. It doesn't mean a thing. For Captain Roger P. Harrell, United States Marine Corps, the Distinguished Flying Cross. From Major Robert Kramer, United States Marine Corps, who also died needlessly, the Silver Star. And everything else. The small bits of metal came down. Silver stars, commendations. One man had nine Purple Hearts. Some speakers called for revolution, power to the people, and the crowd yelled right on. Here, all of us had actually been there, and we had actually uh, experienced it and saw it firsthand. And now we were coming back and saying, hey, look, it's a lost cause. We should just get out of there and forget it's, a, it's, a, it's wrong. 
the throwing away of the medals for me was the cutting of the umbilical cord between me and the government. I was now independent. We decided to block 13th Street and University Avenue. Um, and the purpose was to inconvenience the people of Gainesville long enough to make them have to stop and think about why we're doing this. And we're doing this because our government is escalating the war. The big spark was Kent State had happened and amongst college students. I, I feel like it really, uh, you know, it made us one. Because if they're going to shoot college students over protesting this, what's the next step? When the time was up, we, um, Vietnam veterans against the war left the street. But other people wouldn't. And the police, in a classic overreaction, started kicking people's ass. And what happened was that just swelled the demonstrators. And um, first, they, what they did is they came with fire trucks. This is May, hot, you know, Gainesville. And they sprayed people with fire hoses. And it turned it into a carnival atmosphere. Um, People were singing, people were joking, people, it was like a, it was like a block party. Uh, the Gainesville Police Department formed a cordon. They attempted to move all the protesters up 13th Street and to disperse them. And um, once we got to University Avenue, you know, this police cordon, they're throwing tear gas and that type of stuff uh, with batons and full riot gear. People started coming to the house and saying, they're beating the fuck out of people down there. You know, they're really beating the shit out of people. You guys need to come and help. Um, so we went down there and reconned what was going on, and indeed, the police were out of control. So we made the decision to swing into action, and we did. And um, we monitored the police radio. Um, we sent people wherever the police were. Um, the second night, we were totally prepared. We had hunting slingshots, some monofilament cord um, for making bolos and for, for um, tripping people. Um, the police were coming down the, the street, you know, they're four or five deep sidewalk to sidewalk and they had these face shields on. And um, we hit them with balloons of ammonia. The ammonia comes like this, the face shields came right off. And then people with slingshots pop, 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 started knocking them out. And I believe 18 police officers went to the hospital, 54 were treated on the scene, and Vietnam veterans against the war did not lose one person. Police had a lot of firearms and they had started calling other agencies uh, so you're getting law enforcement that wasn't from this community and if the cops got you you went on the bus and if you went on the bus you went to the uh, Lachwood County Jail and then they booked you and it was a mess. Then the third night it, it intensified a little and people I think saw that they could get killed. At about the third day of the riot slash demonstration a person, bearded person, tapped me on the shoulder and said, you're the mayor of Gainesville, and I said, yes. And he said, would you like to try to end this? And I said, yeah, I'd like to do that. And he said, come with me. And I went into a room, and there were seven or eight men in a, sitting in sort of a semicircle, all had some, something that identified them with the Vietnam Veterans Against the War. I came in, introduced myself all around, and I met a person named Scott Camille. And I told him that I was certain I could expunge the arrest record, that I could make that happen. And he turned to some one or two of the guys that were with him, and he said something to the effect of tell him to go home. And about an hour later, everybody was gone. It literally happened that quick. They were used to beating the hell out of students all the time. Now they had combat soldiers to deal with. You know, we weren't a, a bunch of students that they could just beat the hell out of. And um, they were really surprised. And they shouldn't, have, they shouldn't have never been in the business of beating the hell out of students in the first damn place. So they got what they had coming. And I'm really happy that we gave it to them.
organization of this march at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, while the rest of this park compound was having a land government meeting, it became pretty clear who holds the power here at Flamingo Park. It's these Vietnam veterans. They came here this afternoon, they established that power, and they're showing it right now in this independent display to the National Guard camp. I was a defendant in the Gaines Lake trial. The timing of it was the weekend before the Democratic Convention happened. We were all subpoenaed, taken to Tallahassee, and we were in court until the last day. We were charged with conspiracy to disrupt the Republican Convention with the use of violence. Our intelligence sources had told us that the government was planning on shooting somebody at the convention, blaming that on the anti-war people and shooting the anti-war demonstrators. Uh, by standards of the time, they looked very dangerous. Uh, these men affected um, uh, the sort of long-haired, bearded uh, look that uh, many affected at the time, uh, kind of a hippie look. I think that the majority of people thought that this ragtag group of people had to be guilty. I mean, they looked guilty. They were this ragtag, horribly dressed group of people that had torn jeans and torn khakis. I mean, goodness. So our contingency plan for diversionary action called for attacking all federal buildings, all police stations, and all fire stations in Dade County, Florida, and Broward County, Florida. If we hit those places outside of Miami Beach with firebombs, all of those forces that they're using to beat up on the unarmed demonstrators, they will have to take off to go defend the city. Government, <laughs> the government's case was this mixed bag, as I said, so they either had these people that were totally unbelievable to the people who were believable, but whose testimony either was neutral or helpful to us, that when, when the government finished, our case was pretty much made. In cross-examination, Larry Turner brings one of the toy rifles we had from the demonstrations. He pulls out the gun, he holds it up like this, and he said, uh, is this one of the weapons you saw in the attic? He said, that's them, that's what they look like, and he pulls the trigger and goes, eh, 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 and everybody started laughing, and the judge is pounding his gavel. There was a return air vent in the wall uh, in one of the rooms and you could look through the grid in that return air vent and you could see through it the legs and the shoes of a, a, an adult male. It was, you knew it was an FBI agent. I mean it was just the shoes and the pants were a dead giveaway. Don't ask me how but they were and um, the organization was shot through with spies. There was a guy named Emerson Poe who was another one of Scott's very close friends uh, who was a government uh, uh, spy. And, and the beauty is is that, 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 that people like Poe actually came in and told the truth. And so while they were able to get a lot of spies into the organization, what they hadn't counted on, I think, was Scott sort of disarming honesty and, and charm. And so, so many of the spies, when it came time to testify, got up and told the truth. Well, I think the believability of the defense team and the de defense rather than the prosecution uh, witness, the prosecuting witnesses and the prosecuting attorneys, it was just so much more believable that uh, what they had to say, what the prosecution had to say just didn't ring true. And while the jury was deliberating, we were on the front of the courthouse playing football. Um, uh, waiting for the jury to come in. So we weren't like sitting in the corner biting our nails. You know, we were pretty confident. We knew that we didn't do what they said we did. When we then took our final vote, we decided that they were all innocent. I'm convinced it was an effort to stifle um, that organization because they would be, were so effective in uh, getting the message out and, and, and winning over converts.
Mill was uh, advised that he was under arrest or something to that effect. Uh, a school ensued. He was shot one time. I understand the shot was in the back. The shot was fired by federal officers. Uh, Mr. Camille was taken to the hospital where he is in uh, fairly good condition in the intensive care unit. And the Drug Enforcement Administration, especially back then, and, and I don't know about now particularly because I don't have much interaction with them, but back then was a group of cowboys. They sent in a woman, an attractive woman. She comes in as a, as a plan and she seduces Scott, which is easy to do. I, I mean, that didn't take any work. And, and um, uh, they start fooling around sexually and they start fooling around with drugs. She was my girlfriend and we were having fun. And she introduced me to two of her friends. And those were the two people um, that ended up shooting me. I was charged with uh, possession and delivery of marijuana, possession and delivery of cocaine, um, assaulting federal agents and resisting arrest with violence. DEA uh, targets Scott. Um, their claim is they were looking for drugs. Um, they sure took a lot of stuff that didn't have a damn thing to do with drugs, uh, including all of his private papers. A federal jury came back, found me not guilty, and recommended that the agents be indicted for attempted murder. The agents didn't get in any trouble. In fact, all of the people involved moved up in rank. Getting shot um, by the agents and the way that they did that, um, it made me really bitter. Like, I, I just think that uh, there has to be a line somewhere and that what they did crossed over the line. For 10 years after that, I didn't do politics. I was so bitter. Why should I put my life at risk trying to educate people in the community when they don't stand behind me when the police come after me and try to kill me? I ran into Scott downtown in Gainesville and he said he'd gotten a phone call from some Vietnam vets that he knew from uh, the anti-war times and they invited him to come to Central America with him on a fact-finding trip they were doing. They knew that I had a plane and they knew that I flew and they wanted me to bring my plane down to Central America and to help the rebels. While we were there, American helicopters flew over our heads, taking Guatemalan troops into combat, which was something that um, uh, the American public was not aware of. And we had the cameras, we just slipped the cameras up and boom, now we had documentation. I got a phone call. Joe, Joe, this is Scott. Hey, I'm just back from Central America. I can't believe what I've seen. I'm ready to get active. What should I do? And I just went, whoa. <laughs> you know, Scott's calling me to get active. Okay. When I was in Vietnam, I murdered children. I murdered people that were unarmed, men, women, children, old people, young people. I murdered people. When I went down to Central America, when I was looking in the eyes of the children, I saw my children, and I thought, Scott, if you would have been born here, this would be your children. Your children would be living like this because of another country, because of the United States sending money over here and, and, and sending arms over here and supporting dictators and supporting war. Um, 
If I would have been born there, those children that I were looking at would have been my children. So I came back and um, my energy was going to go into stopping the U.S. war in Central America. For him to go to Central America was an opportunity he couldn't pass up, both for the camaraderie of people he'd been around before and also to see what opened up next. I think um, what's important to me is that, um, that I make a difference, that I've made a difference. And I already know that I have because I've met so many people who said stuff like, gosh, you talked in my classroom 10 years ago and I was going to go in the military, but instead I did this and I'm happy now. I went to college. I have a good job. Um, you changed my life. Thank you. I think it's just outstanding that he's devoting himself a lot more toward local politics and really having an impact. Because as a citizen activist, it's one thing to, you know, to go on the world stage and try to change the world is one thing. To try to change your country is another thing. But when you act within your own community and really try to do something, you can really have an impact. When you go back to Winter Soldier, that's where my change really took place. And if it wouldn't have been for those um, documentary journalists asking me the kind of questions that made me examine my soul um, and examine my brain and examine what I did, you know, I might still be in the clouds somewhere. What happens to man over in Vietnam? Well, it's our general conditioning, even before we get in the service, you know, America's always right, the government's right, you don't question them, we're the best, God's on our side, and uh, things like uh, what happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki showed it's okay to kill civilians, if it's for the best interest of the nation. And when I went there, I went twice, and I believed that it was in the best interest of the nation. And I was sufficiently brainwashed where I did go back the second time, because I really believed it was right. They really asked me the questions that made me think. And once I started thinking, it started me in a course of where I am now. I remember actually watching the Winter Soldier video with him at his house. It was the first time I'd seen it. And sitting in his living room and looking at the, whatever it is, 19, 20-year-old Scott Camille on screen. And when it ended, I, I said, you know, you know, when I'm on video, I can generally remember what was in my head at the moment when that was going on. I said, what does this do, to, you know, how's this to you? And he just said, man, sometimes I don't know who I am. But do you realize how hard it is, like, uh, even even when you tell them what it's like for people to understand, you know? No, I, I can't, you know, I guess I should be able to, and I never thought about it until you just said it. But uh, I imagine it is hard for them. It, I can't perceive it being hard for me because I, I did it, you know, I, ex I experienced it.